Wow, I haven't even done anything yet, and I'm getting applause. This is awesome. Um, so yes, yeah, as, uh, as was just said, I'm going to be talking today about emulating a 6502 system in JavaScript. Um, so first of all, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Matt Godbolt. I work for a fabulous trading company here in Chicago called uh, DRW. Um, I'm contractually obliged to say, we're hiring. Come speak to us. So if this talk is interesting to you, I can't promise that we use 6502s anywhere in our trading stack, but we do have similarly interesting things to do. So come talk to me afterwards, or there's Katie who's waving at the back there who uh, can tell you a lot more about what we do. Anyway, so emulating a 6502 system. Let's just go full screen. There we are. Um, well, first of all, this slide is far, far too uh, high tech. Let's. Uh, Let's go back. You remember this kind of stuff? All right, so first of all, who has ever used a 6502-based computer? Yeah, a fair number of you. I guess probably you wouldn't be here if, uh, <laughs> you, would, uh, if you hadn't. Um, so what is a 6502? It is this. It's an 8-bit computer, first made in uh, 1975, so it's just a little bit older than me. Um, 3,510 transistors drawn out and laid out by hand by just a, a small team of people crawling over a large piece of acetate like you would like for an OHP and drawing in marker pen to where all the tracks would go and then lith lithographically sh shrunk down to sort of this size, um, which is, I just think, um, um, unbelievable. I mean, in, in our, my day job at the moment, we do a little bit of uh, uh, like FPGA development type stuff, and the tooling behind that is amazing, but just the thing that human beings were doing this is just incredible. Um, if it's not, when it's not naked, oh, hang on a second, I have just had an Ubuntu thing pop up on my screen, there we are. When it's not denuded of its uh, uh, plastic case, it looks like this. It's got thousands of pins on the outside, but it's actually just a tiny, tiny little thing in the inside of there. Um, so these, these uh, chips are important because in the 1980s, um, the 6502 along with the Z80 um, was responsible really for the 1980s boom in home computing. It was an affordable chip, it was powerful, um, and uh, certainly for me, it, was, uh, it came at the time when uh, computers were sort of picking up and uh, I suppose directly led to me be being here in front of you, you know, becoming a computer programmer, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So um, I actually contacted over Twitter the people who uh, still have the patents and the rights for the 6502, and I said, have you got any idea how many of these are in existence, thinking it would be you know, a few hundred thousand, I was thinking how many, how many computers with them there have been made, you know, maybe a hundred thousand, maybe a half a, a half a million or something, but apparently more than 10 billion of these things have been produced by just one company, so there's probably much more than that out there. It's pretty incredible. So what kind of computers was the 6502 in? Well. Here you can see we've got the Apple II, we've got the Atari 800 and the uh, Atari um, 2600, the BBC Micro, and there also is uh, the Commodore PET, the Commodore 64, uh, the VIC-20. Um, it was also in the original Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. Uh, it was in the Tamagotchi Virtual Pet, if you ever have one of those really, really irritating things. Um, <laughs> it was also powering the Terminator, uh, in the Terminator films, according to if you freeze frame, like the, in, within the first five minutes, if you remember, like with the, the the sort of text scrolling down the screen, it just looks like random computer gibberish. If you freeze frame that, it's actually part of the Apple II boot, like, bootloader that's been disassembled, so it's 6502, and uh, apparently it's also what powers Bender from Futurama. But uh, the computer that I'm interested in talking to you about, which is sort of ironic, because here I am in Chicago talking to a largely American audience, is uh, sort of strange British computer called the BBC Micro. It, uh, the BBC Micro was made by a company called Acorn in 1981, and it was part of the BBC's um, computer literacy program. So that's the BBC, like the uh, um, Broadcasting Corporation, B British Broadcasting Corporation. They decided that they wanted to run a whole series 
of educational programs explaining what this newfangled computing thing was, why it was important, and in order to do that, they thought that they should have like a, a, a sponsored computer system to go alongside the, 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 the TV um, shows. So they put out to tender this idea of like an affordable, sort of hackable, I guess we'd say nowadays, uh, computer system, and a company called Acorn came up with the winning design, and. Uh, they, uh, they produced this computer, and uh, as a result of that TV series, it became one of the more popular systems in the UK. And uh, if you go on YouTube, you can actually go and see the, the computer program with the British P-R-O-G-R-A-M-M-E spelling. Um, and they are universally dreadful programs now, but you know, it's, it, they were there right at the beginning, and it, and it certainly got a lot of people interested in it. It also meant that there were tons of these around in like schools, so a lot of people in the UK, for this is their first idea about what a computer is, this sort of creamish box with the bright red keys on the top. Um, as a sort of side story, just quickly, um, the company Acorn went on to make other computers after this, and uh, as a testament to how hackable the BBC Micro was, you know, here we are in 1981, and as part of the design, there was a sort of second processor bus that you could connect other processors onto. So they had like another 6502 as a sort of daughter card, or you could get even an, uh, an 8088, or um, some of the other 16-bit computer um, chips that were around. But Acorn themselves decided that they were going to make their own processor for their next generation of computers. They thought that actually they could do a good job. And sort of inspired by the 6502's simplicity and its design, they came up with a 32-bit processor that was originally spiked out and was a second processor to the BBC Micro. Um, they uh, called this the Acorn Risk Machine. And many, many years later, when uh, the Acorn company itself folded, that company that they spun off to look after the IP for that chip was renamed to Advanced Risk Machines, and I'm guaranteeing that there's probably a couple of hundred of those things in this room right now, powering all of our iPhones and our Androids. So in, in many ways, this computer is the logical ancestor of the chip that's inside your, uh, your, your phone. So the Beep had 32K of RAM and 32K of ROM. It ran at 2 megahertz, the whole 2 megahertz, and uh, the hardware attached to it, the, the way the 6502 works, it didn't have instructions that were uniquely able to talk to hardware. Um, you just simply wrote to sort of magic memory addresses, and those mem magic memory addresses on the bus would sort of map out to actual physical hardware. So to like read and write to the keyboard, you would just write to uh, read and write from um, particular addresses. Um, why is it so important to me? Well, I guess in many ways I've already explained that, and sort of following on from the talk we had earlier here about how getting kids into programming, when I was growing up, the way that you got into programming is that you had your computer, you saved up your pocket money, maybe you bought a game every now and then, maybe you did some illicit trading of copied games in the <laughs> playground. Shh. Um, but more importantly, every, every month you would go and buy one of the magazines that you could get from the newsagent, and you would read all about the latest games, and you would read all about the latest sort of things that you're, were coming out for your computer, and at the back would be the sort of half of the magazine would be printouts that you would just type in. And so there would be games, there would be um, examples of like this one here is a fractal like um, rendering thing, and um, you would learn how to program sort of by osmosis. You'd type in these things, or you'd get your mum to read it out to you. You'd tap it away, you would type run, it would inevitably not work. You'd sort of see the syntax error, and you'd go and you look at the listing, and you'd discover that it was a colon and not a semicolon, and all these kinds of things. But, um, but sort of then you'd learn how to primitively, how to debug. So um, I got pretty good at typing these things, and I learned a lot about this, and uh, this particular Oh, sugar, I've just pressed too many times. There we are, there it is. Um, this particular uh, magazine article is one I wrote myself with my, my good friend uh, from school. Um, you used to get 50 quid, for t sorry, 50 pounds, which is what, like $80, for submitting a program that got published in the magazine. So that kept us in, um, in sweets and, and candy for, for quite a lot of time when we were there. So I was about 15 when this w came out. And of course, um, uh, the other reason that these, these kind of um, computer systems are interesting is because of the games, right? That's really what computers are for, as we all know. And so um, the BBC Micro was particularly legendary for this, this game, which I don't know if anyone in this room, other than the people I know who know it, did, yeah, there's some people who have recognized it. This game's called Elite, and um, it's a 3D space trading game or action game. It's, it's one of those, it was one of the first games. I mean, it was 1984, I think. Um, 
And it's just an awesome game. And to get it squished into 32K of RAM, where most of the memory is taken up with the actual just picture you're looking at there, is just incredible. And uh, I've been lucky enough to get in contact with one of the people who wrote the game, and we've been discussing it all. And it's just amazing to think that uh, the reason pretty much that they, they wrote this game is that no one told them that you couldn't possibly do 3D rendering on a 2 megahertz processor. So they just tried it, and turned out you can. And my personal favorite is this one here, which is a game called Exile. It's um, yeah, a 2D physics-based puzzle game. It's just amazing what you could do on such a restricted amount of RAM, such a restricted amount of computing power. OK, so that's why I love the Beeb. That's why I love the 6502 that powers it. Why on earth? <laughs> I can see Sue's taking a picture of this right now. Why JavaScript? Well, because it's fun. I, it really amuses me to take something which is as low level as the assembly code uh, of, a, of, a, of a computer and emulate it in possibly the system the highest, furthest removed from it. Um, but no, there's a real reason too. Um, anyone who's ever played with emulators um, knows that it's a sort of a long, painstaking process usually to get one working on your system. You have to find the ROMs, you have to find the code, you have to find the funny versions of libgdk that it needs, you have to run configure, you have to find the right compiler, you run make, you run it, and then you get a seg fault, and then you're like, oh, what happened here? And you know, all that kind of stuff. They're not very, it's not a great user experience, but everyone understands going to a web page and seeing something. So that's why JavaScript. Okay, so I'm going to explain to you how I wrote an emulator, but before we do that, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of a background about um, what it is um, inside. Sorry, where is my, I've just lost my, my clicker. I've just realized I'm pressing the keys on the keyboard here, and I've got a clicker somewhere. Oh, well, I'll just have to keep doing that. Um, so 6502, it's an 8-bit. Aha, thank you. So it's an 8-bit processor, which means that all of the internals of it are 8 bits wide. Um, it has three whole registers. The uh, first register, the most important one, is the accumulator. That was an 8-bit register, again, that could only be used for like simple, sorry, was the only register you could use for arithmetic. So any kind of adding, subtracting, comparing had to happen with the accumulator. There were two other registers called X and Y, which are pretty much only used for indexing. So you could use them as loop counters, maybe, and you could use them to like index into an array. But other than that, you couldn't do any comparison or arithmetic on them. Uh, you had a whole 256 bytes of stack. Although, if you were anywhere near using more than about 100 of them, you were probably in trouble. Um, the, um, the 6502 has an interesting design, so it's very restricted in terms of only having these three registers. It treated the bottom 256 bytes of RAM slightly differently from the rest of the memory, in as much as there were special opcodes that only allowed you to access those um, addresses, which were smaller and shorter, and obviously every byte you save in terms of memory is one byte more in your, for your game or your, your, op your, your operating system, whatever to use. Um, but also it could treat pairs of values in the zero page, this first um, 256 bytes of memory, as almost like 16-bit pointers. So that was the way that you kind of got around the fact that the rest of the system was only 8-bit. You could use two values in the zero page as your 16-bit pointer. I'll hopefully become a little bit more clear in a second. So this is what the instructions look like. You've got like load and store to registers, transfer between registers, push, pop, compare, add and subtract, all that kind of stuff, and comparisons and branches, um, conditional branches. So that's pretty much what um, most assembly ends up looking like. Um, let's just take one of those instructions, the load A. So this is something which just brings a value into the accumulator. Um, there are a bunch of ways you can bring values into the accumulator. The first and most obvious way is to bring in an actual number. I just want the number 32 into the A register, and that's what this first instruction is, this hash. I'm going to call it hash. A lot of you will think pound. Um, I think the, the proper name for that thing is octothorpe, which uh, is only through arguments with Americans about it not being a pound. Um, that, is, uh, that is sort of like, you, over here we can see these are the opcodes that are actually being, sorry, I can point over here as well. These are the opcodes that are actually being interpreted by the processor to tell it what to do. So you can see that the uh, opcode for load immediate is A9. So A920 means load 20, which is 32, into the A register. And then the, the next two things are reading from memory. So now A5 means load from the memory address 70. So that will read something from byte 70 in the zero page. And then load A1234 will load from the address 1234. And you can see that the, this guy here is A5, and he only needs one extra byte. This guy is AD, and he needs two extra bytes. So if you're using the zero page, it's slightly more efficient. 
Then we get into more advanced things where we start seeing those X and Y registers. And so the top two here are reading um, from an offset from address 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, so you can think of this as really reading the Xth or the Yth element in an array stored at address 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and then the real killer one is this indirecting with all the brackets over here, parentheses. Um, what that instruction means is read the value at address 70, then read the, address, the value at address 71, treat that as being a 16-bit pointer, then add y to it and read the byte from that address. So there's a sort of indirect mode where you can use a pointer at 70 and 71 to point to a particular piece of data. So like your sprite routines would be written so that you would use you know, 70 and 71 as the source of the sprite and 72 and 73 as being like the destination, and you would use these things indirectly through those. So that's a pretty cool concept. Um, to give you sort of some context, the Z80 had, uh, I think, eight registers that you could pair up. So you'd have an A, a B, a C, and a D, and you could use B and C to mean a 16-bit register. But the, the Z80 was much, much slower in terms of it took many, many more cycles to do anything, even if it was running slightly faster. So they sort of netted out. And this is slightly more risky, slightly more risky. Um, sorry, that's risky with a small C, <laughs> not, not risky as in scary or whatever. OK. So you've got a little bit of a sort of groundwork about what, what it looks like to emulate a 6502. Um, how do we start? Well, pretty simple, really. Just like the processor, you fetch the, ne fetch the next instruction, you decode it, and you execute it. What does that look like? Well, that pretty much is an emulator, give or take a few hundred instructions that I haven't put on the slides here. So we've got an A, an X, and a Y, which are going to mirror the register contents of those three registers I was talking about. We've got a program counter, which just happens to start out at a particular address. Doesn't really matter for this. And then we have a loop. Forever, read the next byte. We're assuming there's a function called read mem that's going to go away and read, read memory, whatever that means. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, read the next byte, incrementing the program counter, and then switch it. What does it mean? And as we saw earlier, A9 is the load A with an immediate value. So the code for that is going to be A equals read mem PC++. Let's just read the next byte and then put that into the A register. There's a whole bunch of other things I'm sort of missing out for this, but you get the idea. Um, similarly, like the, the A3 here is to load a, 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 an address, and so the code is a little bit more complicated. But So you, you do this, you get your manual open in your lap, you go one by one through all the like 160 documented codes for the 6502, and you're done. Well. You're done if you like just changing random values inside an array in memory without actually seeing what the heck that looks like. So you actually do have to do a bit more work before it gets more exciting than that. So we need to talk to the outside world. And of course, the most interesting thing to talk about is the video part. So a BBC Micro was usually plugged into a TV. However, if you were very fancy, you did have a monitor. But it ultimately amounted to the same thing. There was something which was, has an electron beam scanning 50 times a second and outputting colors to the screen. Um, there was a dedicated chip inside the computer which was responsible for driving that CRT beam. Um, and the way you talked to that, like any other device, was through memory mapped I.O. So some of the places you could store to, some of those reads and writes to memory, would actually, instead of going to ROM or RAM, they would go to circuits or they would go to registers on hardware that was inside the, the machine. So one of those, again, as I say, would be the video chip. And the video chip has a few registers itself and is a relatively complicated chip in its own right. One of those registers would be, at what address is the screen stored? And you, so you would tell it where the screen was stored, and then every single clock, tick of the clock, or clock of the tick, as I keep saying, um, the video chip would also fetch a byte from memory, and it would interpret it to being, well, well what colors am I going to display here? And there were a variety of ways of interpreting the byte that it had read. But what that means is that every single tick of the clock, the CPU needs to read something from memory, and the video chip needs to read something from memory. Now, if any of you have ever looked at like, how modern graphics cards work, you hear about like, dual-ported or quad-ported RAM, where you can read and write all the same time. And you think, well, surely this must mean you had very expensive and complicated RAM inside a, a 6502-based system. And the answer is no, no. This was in the golden time in computing, the one and only time in computing when RAM was faster than the processor. So as it happened, the RAM ran at twice the speed of the processor. And so it was able to be shared cooperatively with the video circuit. One cycle was given to the, the CPU, and then the next cycle was given to the RAM chip. 
So as I say, some registers allowed you to configure how the video processor worked, and it could do something as simple as read um, the byte from memory and generate eight pixels, either from like a little table. The video chip had its own uh, ROM and had its own set of characters, so you could have a character map to display where it would literally interpret the byte as an ASCII byte and write it to the screen as that picture. Or you could put it into a bitmap mode where you either had a high or low resolution, 2, 4, or 16 color mode. Um, there are other parts of this that you need in order to actually get the system up and booting. Um, as you might understand, like most, most sort of operating systems need some way of doing some periodic work. And so there are timers on the, um, there's a chip that's devoted to, to generating timing signals. So you would basically load a value into it, again, by writing to one of these magic memory addresses, and then the timer would start ticking and counting down, and when it hit zero, it would generate an interrupt, and then the CPU, sorry, the CPU would be interrupted, the operating system would go and check whatever it needed to check. So that's quite a sensitive issue, so we needed to get the timers working as well before we got anything appearing on the screen. And you know, you want to em emulate the sound and stuff, and again, it's just a question of opening the hardware manuals and sort of going through them all. So, let's see what that looks like. If I can, uh, I've just realized the small problem here is that you'll be able to see this, but I won't. Hooray! So this is so, so familiar to anyone who's been in Britain. There's at least one guy who's seen this before. Um, that noise of, of the system booting back up is extremely um, sort of uh, reminiscent. But given that this is a go-to conference, I'm gonna do what everyone did back in 1985. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so many department stores that had computers that were left on, on you know, on the thing would, would end up with things like this running on them. So that's pretty cool. And so, you know, here I am, we're in the mode where it's emulating. Oh, of course, there it is. <laughs> um, so many, um, oh, sorry, we're in the character map mode here. This is called mode seven and, um, uh, uh, so at the moment, what I can do, if I just reset it, I happen to know where the memory for the screen is stored. So just to sort of prove a point, if I've typed this in right, 7C00, um, this is a poke. This is just like raw writing to memory. I mean, it's amazing what you could do. And like nowadays, kids will never like get the opportunity to just write to random parts of their computer's memory. But by putting like 65, the ASCII for A there, I can put an A at the top of the screen and so on. And you know, if I change um, to a different mode, I can start showing you that, oh God, I can't see what I'm doing. Uh, where are we gonna put this one? Let's just do 4,000 equals 255. We can put a big flashing blob in the middle of this screen. So this is a bit mapped mode. It's very low resolution, as you can see, that suddenly the characters have got all giant. Um, so that's cool. Um, so another thing that you'd obviously want to emulate pretty much straight on is, a, is the disk system that was attached to it. You know, the, sometimes you had to load stuff off of cassette tape if you weren't as um, fortunate enough to have the disk drive. Um, I won't subject you to the screeching, horrible five-minute uh, process of loading something off of tape, but so here's a disk, disk system. Um, I can just quickly show... Uh, did I get that? Yay! The, the little yellow light at the bottom is the disk light there. So this is like one of the games that came if you, if you splashed out on the disk system. So, you know, this doesn't look particularly inspiring so far, and it's all in that horrible graphics mode, but, you know, hey, my system's working. It's pretty cool. So obviously, what you next do is you go onto like an online site that has a whole archive of disk images, and you're like, all right, I'm going to play that game that I love so much. And if I can find the mouse pointer, there it is. We're going to load. Now, I should just like to state I have permission to use this image, which is why it's actually even checked into GitHub. We're going to load up that space trading game. And so we have Elite. And we go, awesome. Except we don't go awesome because we're like, ah, oh, well, that doesn't look quite how I remember it. You can save the photograph. It gets better. I'll do another version of this in a minute when you can see it with less corruption. So you can probably see that just under where it says load new commander, it's getting a bit sort of murky, and now it's sort of something sort of scrolling over it now, and ugh, horrible things are happening. So something isn't quite right with our emulation. So what on earth is going on there? Uh, let's try and find a way back. Here we are. So what happened there? Well, as I alluded to earlier, the video chip is a pretty simple device, and um, you could change the way that it interprets those bytes. Um, I also sort of mentioned that there are different modes that it had. It had high resolution, low resolution, high color, low color. All of those come with attendant trade-offs in terms of the amount of memory that it used. And when you've only got 32K of RAM, and most of that's given over to the operating system, every single byte counts. Also, if you're writing a 3D renderer, 
you really want to be right touching as little memory as possible. So if you're using a high color, high resolution mode, you're having to write more bytes to draw the same amount of data. So the people who wrote Elite were smart. They were like, well, what we'd like to do is have the top two thirds or three quarters, whatever that is, in high resolution but low color mode so that I get pretty much a good memory efficiency. But then when I've got my little, um, little chart at the bottom here, which shows you my sort of like um, status and where I am on the map and everything, let's use a few more colors. Let's splash out. What the hell? So how do they achieve this? It's not something the video chip can do, but it is. What they would do is at every time the video chip reached the top and knew that the electron beam had just reached the top of the screen, it would generate an interrupt and say, hey, I'm at the top again. What Elite would do would set up one of those timers to say, hey, count down, and I know exactly how long it takes for the electron beam to scan all the way down to here, to about, ooh, here. And then I'm going to reprogram the video hardware to say, OK, we're now in multicolor mode and low resolution. And as long as I can do it quickly enough, I've got all the time it takes the electron beam to go off the side here, zoom back, and start up here before anyone even notices that I've done this kind of magician's trick and sort of like pull the tablecloth underneath which is cool, right? So why does my emulator not work? Well, I've glossed over a whole bunch of details about how I, that loop was done. So effectively, I have to decide when to draw the picture, right? I was in, the, in my sort of example code of like the while loop. It was just a while forever. Well, at some point, I have to stop and like draw the screen. And so what I was doing in that previous example was just running for like, I don't know, 8,000 opcodes. And then I was saying, OK, now let's draw the screen. And I went back and drew 8,000 opcodes and drew the screen, which meant that, of course, there was no chance for me to ever observe the video in the right place. So how do we fix it? Well, I have to go back to my giant table of opcodes that I've got all my case statements. And instead of assuming that they all take the same amount of time, I have to say, OK, well, load them A immediate takes two CPU cycles. So I have to kind of run the video and the timers for two cycles every time I see a load A immediate. Um, so I've kind of got this coroutine between the CPU and the rest of the hardware. I mean, obviously, in reality, they're all running together at the same time in a real system. Um, but we do that, and now we get an uncorrupt version. Uncorrupt? Is that a word? It is now. Oh, beep. Shh. Jit, jit problems at the beginning. So now, we, as you can see, we, we've got a much cleaner display. But even then, this wasn't perfect, and I've checked it out on a real BBC. This, this also happens on a real beep. See the little dot here that's flashing a little bit? And sometimes you see a little dot down here. It's not quite right. There are some other things that are going on. The timing wasn't perfect. So I mean, how are we doing for time? You'll forgive me if I have a quick play, as it's been so long. But like, seriously, this is a 2 megahertz machine. Isn't that amazing? It's awesome. It's like, and oh, it gets faster when there's nothing on the screen. So this is the space station I've just come out of. So that's what I took the screenshot from. And now if I provoke, provoke, the, provoke the police to come out and chase me. Come on. We can see some other ships as well. It had AI and everything, and it's got like, you know, where are we? That's me. Look, this is the prices of all the goods in this particular place. There's a, it's a dictatorship, apparently. All this was done through like a, a seeded random number generator that they like generated a whole bunch of stuff. And then apparently they had to go through and check that there were no naughty words that had come out as a result of their random algorithm for all the things they did. But it's great. Anyway, so that's it. Whoops, whoops I'm being attacked. Right, that's enough of that. Right. So that's cool. And the best thing about writing an emulator is that once you've done the hard work and you've got all those things worked out, you suddenly have this huge suite of games that were, uh, are available to you. And you can while away many, many long evenings loading up old games and enjoying and, um, the fruits of your labor. And so one of my other favorites was this, which is a blatant ripoff of the arcade game Galaga, which, uh, yeah. So isn't this sweet? So you spend your evenings doing this, and you're like, oh, oh, well, that's unfortunate. And so what you really discovered is that what you spend your time doing is debugging other people's software, <laughs> or rather your own software's problems, except that you don't have the source code. You have no idea what it was doing in the first place. So if you write an emulator, my advice to you is spend as much time as you possibly can writing a decent debugger. So I, in here, I have an instruction level debugger. I can set breakpoints. I can set watch points. I can put arbitrary bits of JavaScript to run on certain conditions. It's a godsend. Now, I'm cheating here, because I actually remember this game from my childhood, and um, I know exactly what this crash is. But um, oh, if I can remember the number, I will just go. I don't think you can read this anyway, so you might have to just take my word for this. But um, 
that gray blob there is a question mark, question mark, question mark. So basically, the, the point at which we're stuck on here is uh, an instruction for which I don't know. Right? It's an undefined instruction. Now, of course, on a modern PC, what would happen if you hit an undefined instruction? You get like a seg fault, it dis you, know, you get like a blue screen of death or whatever, depending on which mode you're in. But the, basically, the processor knows that you've tried to do something you shouldn't do. On a, on a uh, 6502, what happens? Well, it just plays on, you think. So in fact, my default case in my like, um, big switch statement is just PC++ continue, hooray. Um, that's clearly not right, because why would they have done this? Um, if we take a look, if we can get the mouse pointer back on my screen over here, oops, there we go. If we take a look at what the opcodes are around that funny instruction, so that instruction is um, hex 87, which was not in my table. We look at the ones nearby. We've got 84 apparently is store Y, 85 is store A, 86 is store X, 87 is undefined. Hmm. Well, there's a sort of pattern going on here. It looks like for this sort of sequence of bits, the CPU is interpreting it as a store something. And then depending on the bottom two bits, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, it's the Y register, the A register, or the X register. OK, so maybe we can get a clue as to what this other instruction is doing, because it must be doing something. Well, thankfully, people much smarter than me have taken the time to do something absolutely incredible. So a big thanks to the Visual 6502 people for letting me do this. Um, this is um, a circuit diagram of the 6502. So the reason I know there are 3,510 transistors is because these guys have decapped a 6502. They have taken loads and loads and loads of high-resolution photographs of the die. They've then shaved off the top layer and done it again, and then they've shaved off the next layer and done it again. They've written programs to stitch those together. Then they've written image recognition software, which can find where all the gates are, and they have reverse-engineered the entire transistor netlist of the 6502. So that's an amazing achievement in itself, and that's where I got like, the picture at the beginning of the naked 6502. But more so than that, they've been able to write emulators and simulators for that netlist, and so I can run a virtual 6502 and look at every single bit going on. Additionally, they've taken the time to reverse engineer further, and they've worked out where the accumulator is stored, where that A register is, where the X register is, where there are all these type of things. And so in this picture here, this is like a top-level shot. You can't quite see it here. This guy says, instruction decode. This sort of regular-looking array turns out to be a, I'm going to have to look at my notes, 130 by 21 ROM. Now, it's addressed in a very strange way, so I'm not going to go into it, but effectively, the instruction that was read is taken, it's some bits are min, uh, flipped fr fr from, the, from the instruction, um, and some extra timing information is added to give you like a 21-bit like lookup. That's presented to the ROM, and the 130-bit output from that ROM is energizing various parts of the circuitry. So there's no microcoding or anything like that. It's just like, well, if it matches this bit, bit pattern, then you need to do this on this sub-cycle of this instruction. And if you take the time to reverse engineer the entire table, as other much smarter people than me have done, you discover that in that 87 case, what's happening is both the A register and the X register are enabled at the same time. So as the store is going to write to memory, the A and the X are together presented to the bus. Now, it turns out that the zeros win out. So what really happens is A and X is written, and in fact, this was well known. People had experimented with 6502s before they'd even decapped it and everything. People knew about this, which is exactly why it was in that game. Um, this is the somewhat confusing store AX instruction, which actually stores A and X. So you find a big list of all of these funny undefined opcodes, and you fill in the rest of your table. And so you now, instead of having just 160-odd entries in your, your case statement, you have all 256. They all do something useful. And now you can run a load of games. Then. Of course, I, I, this, this is, uh, I guess this is an admission of mine. I, I may have alluded earlier to the uh, um, uh, playground transfer of uh, illicit uh, games um, that I uh, may, may have partaken in in my youth. But um, so this game here, Alien 8, it came on cassette. And I could never get it to run on my computer, because I actually had a slightly different version of the, uh, the BBC. I had a BBC Master, the upgraded version, where they happened to use a different version than the 6502. They used a 65C12, which unfortunately meant all the undefined opcodes did different undefined things. So like a whole bunch of games didn't work. So I spent a lot of my youth hacking games just to get them to work on my computer, which is exactly why I knew where Zaliga was going wrong. I knew that that didn't work on the computer that I had. Um, 
But this game, Alien 8, and a bunch of other games related, all written by the same author, I could never get to work. And the reason for that is they had protection systems on them, which most games did, but these protection systems I was unable to break as a 15-year-old in my bedroom. So let's just talk briefly about what a protection system is. I mean, this is DRM, the birth of DRM, you could say. Um, so the general gist of it is that you would take the game code, uh, the authors would take the game code, they would encrypt it in some way, and then they would place the decrypt routine just before they immediately ran into the game itself. And they would have, by this point, they'd have disabled all of the interrupts or set them up in their own way. They'd have made sure the operating system is no longer involved, and they would have set a bit in the RAM, which meant that even if you hit the like, restart button, it would bl blank all of the RAM out. So basically, as soon as you were that, you were locked in, the, the next thing that would happen would be the game would play. And so you had no opportunity to stop it and say, can I save this off, please, and take a copy. So if it's encryptable or decryptable, why, why can't I decrypt it? I mean, I can load up the code, right? And I can see what it's doing, and I can decrypt it just like it is. Well. It was more complicated than that, obviously. So the decryption keys would include things like magic values that were loaded from tape. So if you were able to talk to the tape controller directly, you could actually listen for something which wasn't like a normal tape signal at the end of your loading and kind of go crackle, crackle, crackle. Yep, that's exactly what I was expecting. And now I've got a sort of a, a magic part of my key that can decode the game. And of course, the assumption there is that when you're using your tape to tape, tape hi-fi deck, you would stop it after the noises have stopped and you wouldn't actually pick up that bit or it wouldn't translate as well. Um, similarly for disc games, games that had disc protection would use like direct talking to the disc controller to like read apparently bad sectors that weren't in fact bad that copying programs wouldn't see. So that, that would prevent you from copying the game rather than preventing you from disassembling it and changing it. Um, this is kind of fun. Um, the decryption code would often use itself as part of the key. Why would you do that, you say? Well, if it didn't include itself, what would be stopping me from replacing the very last instruction of the de de decryption code with a return statement, like a little return instruction? Then it would run through, happily decode the game, and then instead of running off into the game, it would stop and I could save it. Well, if the, get, if the encryption decryption code uses itself, like the opcodes of itself as part of the key, if I modify it in any way, then of course I, it, it's going to corrupt the game and, and not, not decode. So that's pretty cool. But there are ways around that. You can hack around that. Um, it gets really funky at this point, though. The really good game protection systems would use hardware timers and hardware registers. So while they were running, they would read from those memory mapped counters that were forever counting down. That meant that if you disturbed the amount of time it took to do the decryption in any way whatsoever, the timers wouldn't stop. They keep on going on. You would start getting bogus values. The key would be corrupted, and the game would not decode. So you couldn't even like single step in a deb even if you had a debugger, but you couldn't single step through it because you would disturb it. And in the registers are another thing. I used to, in my own game protection systems, I would use um, like the position of the hardware cursor because, of course, if you're single stepping through the code, you've probably got some overlay on the screen and you're moving the cursor around. No one's expecting you to read the position of the cursor. And, uh, <laughs> um, and then the really, really cool games would use the interrupt information. They would set up their own interrupt handlers to happen at a particular time, and then they would mutate the key. Maybe it would just like add one to the key randomly every time the interrupt hand for fired, which, which was well, you know, pretty perplexing. So my friend Richard and I, the guy who I wrote the, um, the magazine article with, we sat down and we thought, how are we going to crack this game? So Alienate uses all of these things and more. And so we thought, let's write a 6502 emulator, and then we can decode the game by running our emulator and stopping it when it gets to the end. And we spent many, many evenings and afternoons after school trying to get this to work. But you need such deep, intimate knowledge of what's going on to be able to do it. You know, it's so sensitive to timing. I mean, one example is like, um, there's an instruction inside the, um, uh, the alienate protection where it says, rotate this memory address, which means read it, shift it all up by one, move the carry into the bottom, and write it back out again. It takes seven cycles. There's no, no indication which cycle it does the read in and which cycle it does the write in. And those things are very important because every single cycle the counter is ticking down and so you're getting different values. So I'm starting to run out of time here, but I'm just going to very quickly show you Visual 6502, which is not mine. This is the guys who decapped the, um, um, the 6502. This is their JavaScript emulator of like a, a, the transistor level. And you can sort of single step through and see which parts of the chip are lit up at what cycle. And even more importantly, if I can get over to here, you've got a list of all the things that are going on inside the chip at each cycle. So armed with this information, I could single step through and I could find out which 
which cycles it was reading and which cycles it was writing, so I could actually put in the emulation that I finally needed to do. Um, here it is, because you couldn't really see it in that last slide. So did I say seven cycles? It's six cycles to do a rotate. Um, so you can see the first three cycles, it's reading the opcode and the low and the high byte of the address that it's going to uh, rotate. Then it actually reads that memory. Then it does the rotate, which takes a cycle. And then in the final one, it stores it back. But one of the more interesting things in this is that it actually writes back in the fourth cycle as well. There was no pin on that 6502, so none of the pins on this chip, which said whether it wanted to talk to the memory or not. It just happened every clock cycle. So whatever was left on the bus, on both the address side and the data side, was being just broadcast out. Now, so on that fourth cycle, it's writing back the unmodified value which again is no harm, no foul, right? Okay, if you write to memory twice, what difference does it make? Except that FE48 here is one of those hardware timers, writing to it actually has a side effect. It does something to it. It actually cancels an interrupt that's going and um, can cause all sorts of things to happen. So you have to model that too. Um, so very quickly, how do we fix it? Well, you, suddenly your code is looking a lot more complicated. There's no more like run hardware for two cycles at the end. I have to account for every single cycle as it's going through within an instruction. Um, this is very complicated looking, but it's actually code generated from, from a table. So I actually have a big table of all of the opcodes. The same thing I used to generate the disassembler, I actually now use. And I have a sort of rule engine that understands the rules of what things do get written and read from by the 6502. And it can emit all of this code. So I didn't actually have to write all this stuff. So. Um, it's not as painful as it seems. Um, we don't really have too much time to go over this, but there's another layer of complexity on this, which, which is that the hardware itself ran at half the speed of the CPU. So we've got the RAM running at twice the speed and the hardware running at half the speed. And in order for the CPU to access the hardware, it kind of had to be slowed down. And so there's this thing called cycle stretching where the clock coming in is kind of tied up high. It's like, whoa, there on the reins. And of course, depending on whether you're on an even or odd cycle compared to the hardware, is whether it takes three cycles to kind of get in step or five cycles. So there's a lot of subtlety in terms of the timing. So armed with all of this, and a friend of mine who back in the UK still has one of these computers running tons of experiments for me. I was able to get the whole thing decoding. And I'm glad to say, finally, 30 years probably too late, or 25 years later, I've been able to hack Alien 8. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turbo go through this. Um, I just want to make a few things about um, the performance stuff. So JavaScript is not well known for being a fast language, although the JIT guys are amazing. Um, I'd just like to say some things I discovered along the way. Uh, first of all, switch statements. It's amazing. If you have a big, big switch statement, most JITs inside like Chrome and Firefox give up. They're like, well, this is a 256 entry case statement. I'm giving up on this. So it just interprets it. So don't do that. I actually have a binary search to find the opcode for, um, for Chrome. And I think I use a set of jump tables for, for Firefox. Um, don't do dynamic dispatch. It's a really cool thing to do. You can have like a, a single thing which points at which routine is going to be called on which cycle, and you keep writing over it and stuff. Again, the, 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 the JITs go, whoa, every time I call this function, it does something different. I can't inline anything, and it gives up, and it goes back to um, um, interpreting. Amazingly, loop unrolling is alive and well. So you remember the old technique of like um, taking a snippet of code, and instead of putting it in a loop, you actually just copied the code eight times or whatever. That actually made a big difference in terms of the loop code, uh, the video code, where I'm going to do eight pixels at a time, which is sort of slightly sad. Um, use typed arrays for the screen. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, WebGL was a massive win for me. I mean, it's hardly doing anything, but by doing the presentation part using WebGL, it meant that I actually get some like, multi primitive multi-threading where the GPU is doing the screen blip while I'm carrying on with the next frame. Um, and I did some complicated stuff to defer the sound. So um, the sound is done in a, come and talk to me afterwards. But um, you know, again, people were, um, were doing some cool things with sound, like there was sampled speech was, was, was a thing by like sitting in a very, very tight loop, changing the volume of the sound very, very, very quickly. Um, cool, so in conclusion, you can get an awful lot of fun out of doing this kind of stuff. Um, this is not my first emulator. In fact, my, my first emulator was a Sega Master System emulator. Um, which I wrote in, uh, with a friend in ARM assembly way back when, and then I ported to JavaScript. So I've had a bit of a history of doing this kind of stuff, but it's so rewarding, especially when once you start posting this stuff out there, people whose games these are will get back in contact with you or will at least answer your emails. And I was very lucky that the guy who wrote Elite got back to me after I wrote a blog post about how I'd cracked their like, compressed text format 
that I was trying to like, <laughs> a friend of mine on a mailing list uh, wanted to have like a, a hacked name inside Elite and he'd done it in Photoshop and I'm like, I can do one better than a Photoshopped version of this. I can give you a version of the game that has that hack in it. But it turns out I couldn't find it. I was just, you know, I grepped through the thing looking for the ASCII that I was expecting to change and it wasn't there. So on a huge odyssey of like, how does this actually work? And I, I emailed him afterwards and said, hey, I, I think I reverse engineered your, uh, your string format. And he says, yep, that's pretty much it. And he sent me back this, which is an original scan of the sort of like fan feed computer printout that he and the other author had written, um, like the original list of like um, tokenized strings, which you can barely see. I'm so sorry. But that was so rewarding. Anyway, I'm well over time. So... Um, I've got a list of resources there. You can go and play it on the web. Um, it's on, the source is all on GitHub. Uh, Visual 6502 is amazing. They're also doing other chips, so do look at their website. Um, big thanks to the people listed there. And uh, like the man said, please remember to rate this cess. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>